with a presentation Smell. by uh, Chief Spera. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me, Commissioners. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a concept that uh, has been rolling around St. Lucie County since January of, two, of 2016, uh, a safety village. It was first endorsed by the uh, executive round, the round table in January of 16. A group of folks in March of 16 went to look at uh, Cobb County, Georgia's concept and uh, see if it would work for St. Lucie County. Uh, since then, we've put together a board. We've secured some property with uh, the city of Port St. Lucie, and we're looking to seek partnership with the school district moving forward. I will be presenting part of this uh, presentation and Rhonda will be hitting you with some of the numbers on the back side of it. This is an artist's rendition of uh, what we intend to build. It'll have a, a garage area to facilitate um, car seat installs, a program we currently do, uh, but these will be done in an air conditioned environment, a little bit more organized fashion. It's a two story structure. We're uh, trying to partner with uh, IRSC. They have, uh, right now the site we're looking at is on Ravenswood in between the fire station and the county pool. It's a multifaceted safety vill village where children and adults will participate in hands-on safety lessons and more. The facility will allow the opportunity to demonstrate and apply knowledge gained while visiting the village. This is the, uh, the safety village of Cobb County, Georgia. You see the covered area where the buses come in. And I think uh, they also have a village set up uh, to mimic more or less one of their downtown cities. They also incorporate railroad crossing. They have pedal bicycle, uh, pedal cars and bicycle training on site. The areas we're gonna be addressing are gonna be child passenger safety, obviously. Fire safety. One of the things they do in this, uh, in this facility is when they first walk in, there's within the building, the outside of a home structure. They go in, they'll go into the kitchen and learn kitchen safety. So many of our kids go home that are latchkey kids uh, that don't know about kitchen safety, the stove, uh, the oven, even though a lot of these kids are cooking for themselves at a pretty young age. In addition to that, they'll take them over. After that visit, they'll bring them into the bedroom. They can charge the, the, the uh, bedroom, as you can see, with inert smoke, and then teach them about finding pathways out of the home. They also, uh, what this particular one does, they have a, a solid core door that fills up with hot water to teach the kids to touch the back of the door to determine if it's gonna be safe to enter that room. If it's not, then they're, they're taught to look for alternatives like getting through the window, show them how to open the window and climb out safely. Gun safety, again, this will be reiterated on campus there. Pedestrian safety, which is uh, critical, particularly with our kids coming and going from school and water safety. Uh, we have so many drownings in St. Lucie County, we really want to tack start tackling this problem head on. Uh, two years ago in 2017, uh, brought this up re recently, we had um, in a six week period from about Thanksgiving to Christmas, we lost three children, two to drowning in, a, in the same incident and one in a car accident where he was unsecured and killed on Christmas morning. All those were preventable deaths that we're hoping we can start to train our kids out of. Cyber safety, which applies to both adults and children. Um, again, it's not anecdotal, but you know we've raised an entire generation of kids about stranger danger. And in retrospect, we look back and the amount of danger that the kids were exposed to compared to the effort we made was minimal. 90% of those children that were abducted were abducted by people they knew or family members. But what we do have is a real problem is, I, I'll, I had a detective put it to me, he goes, you put yourself out there as a 14 year old boy or girl, he goes, and you could see the sharks hit the water. And it's teaching our kids how to, how to prepare themselves, how to reduce their exposure on the internet, uh, how to protect themselves on the internet. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more deeply, but one of the things they do is they'll, they'll give kids lap, uh, tablets. Hey, we have a little delay before we start. You got about a half hour. Do not make an online profile, but you're free to play games. And they'll go back later and see how many kids actually established an online profile when prompted to. So, and they'll teach them about how you put yourself out there and the dangers you expose yourself to. In addition to that, we have adults that, el the elder population is, is greatly targeted. We're gonna be looking to do evening programs with respect to that. And we're gonna get it, Rhonda, would you like to pick it up from here? 
Okay, so this is our data specific to St. Lucie County for emergency room department visits. And so we have to realize this doesn't capture every child that suffers an unintentional injury or an injury. Um, some parents choose to use their providers, their pediatricians or orthopedists um, when there's an injury involved. So for emergency room department visits, according to our data injury surveillance system, in 2018 we had 9,698 children seen in the emergency room. Of those, 92-17 were for unintentional injuries. So whether it was a bicycle related, pedestrian related, um, a fall, motor vehicle, uh, maybe a possible near drowning, they were seen into the ER. And um, the other, I just used the word other because it just sounds kind of crazy to say intentional. So, oops, wrong way. So for our hospitalizations, we had a total of 166 children hospitalized due to injury, and 143 of those were due to unintentional injury. Again, maybe a near drowning, pedestrian, bicycle safety, fire, um, uh, child passenger safety. And then our, our fatalities. We had 17 fatalities, and 15 of those fatalities were due to unintentional injury. So then I broke it out a little further this weekend doing some research, and our unintentional injury cost for these children with emergency department visits and hospitalizations is around $73 million for 2018. For our emergency room department visits, we rank 14 out of the 67 counties, so we're in the top 20. We are 19 out of the 67 counties, and for our fatalities, we're 12 out of the 67 counties. We're 12. So right now, currently, my program, we do um, some drowning prevention, but we ask that the county pick that up because we're so busy. But we do cover bicycle and pedestrian safety through the Safe Routes to School funding. And we have um, Stacy, the public educator for the fire district that does fire safety. The safety village, grades that we would target would be K2, 4, and 6. And we don't look at it as a field trip because we're meeting those core standards in health and PE to come to us and receive multiple hands-on uh, lessons during that time they're with us. So last year, um, between County Aquatics, myself, and public education, out of K2, 4, and 6, we serviced 4,656 students. Coming to the village, we would serve um, and this is based off of the numbers with the school board, 11,936 students. So with them coming to us, you can see that we definitely can reach a much larger population um, than we are able to pushing into the schools. Now, I will say with my program, and I believe Stacy's, we have served um, one, three, and five, but even our total numbers, we didn't get to 11,000 children, even pulling in first, third, and fifth. So you can see we're just gonna reach a larger number with them taking that time to come to the village. There's so much that kids need to know these days to keep themselves safe. Cyber safety, bullies, strangers. But what about the basics? Tell me and I will forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me. I will understand. Little learning, lifelong safety. Welcome to the YMCA's Children's Safety Village. It's just what the name suggests, and more than you might expect. Discover a real-world classroom in a child-sized village where kids are active participants in their own learning, from fire safety to traffic safety. Uh, where do you begin with the Safety Village? There's just so many things and it's so realistic. What we do basically is teach kids to get out and stay out, the basics, stop, drop and roll if they get fire on their clothes. And we have this incredible facility in which to, to do these exercises. So here we teach them how to make a fire drill, an escape plan. How do you get out of your house? What are all the ways out? Where do you go once you're outside? and then we get to practice it. I think that the benefit is, is they get sort of real hands-on safety lessons and they can apply those without being in a dangerous situation. So we do go over with them about how to be a good passenger in a car and how to be a good passenger on a school bus as well to help prevent those kinds of collisions. 
With a 26-building mini-city that includes streets with operational traffic signals, road signs, a railway crossing, and a life-size school bus, YMCA Children's Safety Village is the place for childhood experiences that save lives. A little learning, lifelong safety. We've been coming to the Children's Safety Village for at least six years now. And uh, it's a great place for kids to learn all their safety rules. It's just a good way for kids to, to stay safe. But I think coming to the Safety Village, they're really exposed to a lot more um, things that they can see and do. So it's a lot more hands-on. So we want to get as much hands-on um, experience for the kids. So coming and doing a field trip just allows them to experience so much more than being in the classroom. When you get children at this age and involve them in something like this where they're actually hands-on, they suck it up like sponges, and I tell you, they go home and they talk to their parents about this, and the parents, secondhand, learn as well or better than if they were in the classroom themselves. We take a lot of pride in what we do, trying to put across these key messages that could save lives. So as you could see from the video, we would have the educational complex, which is the main building that's um, in the bottom of all of the slides, which is where the firehouse would actually be inside that building that looks like a home. But behind the building would be an actual mini streetscape with working traffic lights, working railroad arms, working pedestrian signs, walk, don't walk, crosswalks, where we can actually teach them real life lessons to what they're going to see when they're out in our community. All right, so I'm gonna, I'll set this up for you a little bit before Lydia presses, presses play. This little girl is not calling 911 um, because there's a fire in the home. She's calling because she was at the Children's Safety Village and she learned a very important lesson um, and there was domestic violence taking place in her home, but the lesson she learned at the village was how she knew that she could call to get help. Um, and this was sent to us by the Cobb County Children's Safety Village. Out here. We're going to get a police officer out there for you, okay? Please. How old are you, Tiara? I'm nine. Okay. Just stay on the line with me, okay? Okay. Okay. And if you get scared, just put the phone down, but don't hang up the phone, okay? Okay. The reason why I knew this phone doesn't work, but the police, when I went to the fire safety, they, was, they said that you could call the police with uh, whether the phone works or not. That's right, and you're a very brave girl for calling. So at the Safety Village, she learned that you can use a landline, not that many people have landlines, even if there was no service to it, but also with a cell phone. As long as the battery has a charge, you can still dial 911 for help. And this is kind of what... Um, Chief Spear went over when we first presented to the round table in 2016, and then March of 2016, we went and spent three days at the Cobb County Children's Safety Village, um, a group of us. And that's when we came back and really started um, working on the idea of bringing that concept here to St. Lucie County. And these are our current board members. Um, Chief Spear is the chair. We have Doug Farrell as the vice chair, um, Gary Wilson. Chief Wilson, uh, Karen Kozak, who's with Public Safety, Karen Knapp, United Way, um, Robert Votlin with the Police Department, Clint Sperber with Health Officer, and Councilwoman Morgan. And then one more slide and we're done. Keeping our community safe is the number one goal of us here in St. Lucie County. I'm Sheriff Ken Mascara, agency and leaders throughout our community are working together to make the Treasure Coast Safety Village a reality. It will be a great learning environment for everyone who visits the Safety Village. At the Sheriff's Office, we're committed to this project. We know it will teach valuable lessons and save lives. To learn more, visit tcsafetyvillage.com. Well, thanks very much for your time. Uh, I think the biggest challenge moving for this step at this point is we're looking for a partnership uh, with the school district. There's no point in moving forward unless we have that partnership. We've talked a little bit about the transportation cost. Um, as you can see, I have one public educator that is barely scratching the surface. We've had 
multiple conversations with her, how do we get more in depth in the schools? And she just said, it's a transportation issue for her, that she's spending a lot of time on the road, bouncing from school to school. It's a coordination effort. She goes, if you can put me in one spot, she goes, I think I can tackle the entire popu the school population. Um, it, for the cost of a second public educator, uh, it's ch the transportation co cost for those 11,000 students is actually cheaper than bringing on another educator. And frankly, I don't think it would be as effective as having a centralized location uh, dedicated to this. Thank you, yes, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Um, I think that because uh, you're just giving a presentation, there's no action today at right. all. There might be some things you would like to provide to the superintendent's office. That would be possibly the number of safety villages that exist. There's statistics that shows that they have actually moved the needle on child safety. We are very program focused, not location focused, mm -hmm. as you know. So if you have an inventory of the existing programs that exist that can be uh, maximized and built on, uh, that would be helpful for a further discussion. Okay? Excellent. If it, anyone? No? Yes. Thank you. What are the operating costs of, the, of those other villages, too? Just if you could give those to the superintendent. Yeah. So most, a lot of the safety villages in Canada, or their operating cost is consumed into their public safety. It's run by um, the fire departments, law enforcement, and that's how they run theirs here. Um, in the United States, the safety villages are basically run with a nonprofit side and a government side. So basically, the setup for our village would be that we have fire department employees that are assigned to the village to work, health department employees, um, law enforcement employees, county employees, city employees that are assigned to provide this education, and that goes to those entities' budgets. And then we would just have the nonprofit side, which that money comes in based off the buildings that you saw in the back. Those are then purchased by, say, um, uh, I know Chick-fil-A has several here in the United States, Wawa, Publix, they buy their building facades and then they pay um, an annual maintenance fee on that building for that facade. And then of course, as a nonprofit side, you would do fundraising, um, but that's really basically, you have a government budget which consumes most of your staffing and then the nonprofit side would cover the maintenance and whatnot. So just for clarity sake, what do you, what type of financial uh, obligation we as a school district would have toward this program I don't believe that we're asking for any at this point financial obligation no Correct? no it's a commitment to work with us forward in terms of the kids we can even work out like I said I think we can work out the transportation issues it's just a commitment to move forward with us if we don't have a partnership there's really no point in moving forward mm -hmm. and I, we will pull up some data for you from other villages within the state and nationally that we've taken a look at. Well, I think it's a great idea in regards to our children having hands-on learning even more and going out into the community as well as the partnership. Um, and I, my main concern was the financial burden that it might have toward the district. All right. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Superintendent. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, we're going to have a uh, presentation. Keeping our communities. <laughs> See <he> back? Yeah. <laughs> sheriff here? There is a sheriff here. <laughs> you hear that voice in the middle of the night? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, as you're walking out, I'll let you know on Tuesday we're having a ribbon cutting at 9 o'clock, and I know we invited several of you. Um, but if I missed you, you're welcome to attend and look forward to seeing you. It's free for you guys, for you guys. Okay, um, Brian's here, and um, Brian, where's the... Uh, right here. You got it? Okay, I want everybody to see how thick that is. For each one of our schools, there's how many questions? 400, there's 425 questions. There's 425 questions for every school that Brian and his team has gone out, and this is due to the state, I, uh, I guess November 1st, and needs board approval, so we will vote on it today. He's going to, uh, he and his team have been doing a, an outstanding job of, uh, I, of pulling this together. We're hopeful that this can be, um, 
this is very comprehensive that the state legislature and folks will uh, kind of condense this because there's a lot of repetition, but it's required by st legislation right That's now correct. to do the safeties uh, and assessment checks at our school centers. It's just um, I wanted the board to see the volume of it just for one school. We have 30, well, 40, I think 40. 40 we have 40, sites. but we actually submitted 42 because we also did Pay Center for Girls. We did the, and Data House, which we did last year. Oh, yeah. And additionally, we are also now responsible for making sure the charter schools so I was working with them on submitting their assessments in a timely manner, going back and forth. Their active assailant plan, their training, they had to certify. We sent them, I worked with John Ferguson on a survey that they had to check off to submit to us that they were complying with the law because in the district survey that you have today, there's about seven questions that speak specifically to charter schools that we have to check off, yes, they are complying. So we're all so responsible for making sure that they're complying with the law. And I'll just ask this additional uh, The document also I just want to um, point out is that it's not just a check the box and move on. Uh, there were a lot of questions, describe, list. It was a tremendous amount of information. I want to thank IT. I want to thank uh, facilities because they provided a lot of information that was necessary on projects and project costs. So it was truly a team effort to get this done. Uh, what I'm passing around, that is the, this is the second year we've done the school risk assessments that have been required. This is a, basically a new requirement. Um, as a result, we generated 42. We started it in July, and we just finished it just prior to October 1st. We uh, submitted all 42 a day before the deadline, uh, so we did comply with that. What we went ahead and did is we have a best practice uh, safety committee, and we have already met. Uh, these recommendations that I'm showing you today are as a result of going through the 40 assessments and determining what additional security uh, requests there are and what additional things that we may have to do to improve security at the various schools. I want to point out not every recommendation is for every school. There may be a handful of schools that one recommendation is applicable to. So we're going to go ahead and, um, as I mentioned, by October 1st, we submitted everything by September 30th. And my officers were the lead in meeting with the principals, the APs, school staff, uh, plant managers, sitting down, going through the document. We also had to coordinate campus tours with law enforcement, so there was a lot of moving parts in generating those documents. It was extremely uh, time consuming. The district threat assess, the uh, district oh, used to be called OPAGA. Uh, assessments, what we're doing today is what has to be approved by the board. The other ones just have to be submitted to FDOE. This has to be approved by the board, so that's the document that you have that will need your approval and then we'll submit it to FDOE prior to November 1st. The specific recommendations, uh, as I went through and I met with the committee, um, boiled down to a number of different things uh, that I'm bringing for you today. The committee is going to go through those and actually determine what the priorities are. Some require funding, some may require some training. Uh, the first one, as you know, uh, we spent a lot of time and effort and money on six-foot fences in the perimeter areas. Uh, as a result of doing the campus tours and the surveys, uh, we did find some additional areas that need additional fencing. Uh, so that was included in um, uh, that recommendation that there are a number of schools that are asking for some additional fencing. Uh, the second, the cellular signal dead spots. Uh, I want to point out a lot of the schools had mentioned we have Wi-Fi dead spots, and that, that's really not correct. Uh, essentially what it is is cellular dead spots, and I think a lot of this can be uh, dealt with with regard to training, and we're doing that right now, that when you're in a school connecting to our Wi-Fi, connecting to our, our cell phone calling, so you can receive the signal. So that's really uh, what we're talking about. It's not Wi-Fi dead spots. It's essentially, if you, if you have AT&T or you know, so many schools or shelters, you go inside the building, you're not getting signal. That's why it's important, especially with the Volo app and everything, that you connect to the Wi-Fi, you connect to the cell phone, uh, cell phone calling, or the Wi-Fi calling, so you can receive 
the Volo alert or what have you. You can make phone calls and receive data. No trespassing signs. This is something I've met with John uh, Gillette on already on the perimeter fencing is posting no trespassing St. Lucie Public Schools. Uh, this is pretty common, a lot of places, a lot of school districts. There are some schools that we're talking about the addition of enhancing some additional lighting um, at the schools. Uh, continue with the digital migration plan to convert all school-based radio systems to UHF digital systems. Uh, the UHF digital systems and repeaters at identified schools. This is a school-based radio system. We have purchased in the last five years, we the district, 877 UHF radios for the schools. Uh, when I took over, it was really kind of a mishmash. Uh, one of the things I recognized, we needed to move forward. The goal is eventually to connect all the schools together. So if I'm a principal at one school, I can actually go on my radio, dial over, talk to a principal at another school through a repeater, through IP. So we're building the infrastructure, it takes time. Uh, we have installed 14 repeaters at 13 schools. So the plan is to continue with that. Uh, we have a repeater in this building that was installed with the construction of the building. So we're gonna have an internal radio system here uh, for staff to utilize to communicate. Continue addressing radio communications issues with the public safety. 800 megahertz radio system. This is the portable radios that law enforcement fire rescue uses that come into the building. Um, in a lot of schools, we didn't have signal. Uh, we have installed to date 41 signal amplifiers for the law enforcement, the 800 megahertz radio, so when they come into a building, they can communicate. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a BDA in this building that was installed. I met with the vendor yesterday, and that is operational right now. There are a couple of schools that were requesting additional signage directing to the office, the main entrance. Uh, expand and add security cameras to cover the blind spots. Uh, there were a number of schools that mentioned that there were additional areas. And if you recall, it's only been about a year and a half that we actually completed the project of every school having a camera system. Uh, when I took over in 13, we had 12 schools that didn't have camera systems. All schools have them as of last year, but now we're in a point where we have to evaluate and take a look at where do we want to expand, where do we need to add cameras. So we're going to look at each school and see and there may be schools that need only one or two cameras, there may be other schools that may, need more to expand. So the committee will be focusing on that and following up with the schools uh, to determine those locations. Replace the padlock gates with push gates again. Uh, there's several schools that indicated that. We will, with facilities and the committee, be looking at those locations to determine what are the alternatives as far as, because even with push gates, you know, there's some concerns because in the past, somebody could take a, a, nap, a backpack and flip it over and open the door from the inside. So uh, there's things that need to be uh, worked on with that. Numbering the exterior windows on the first floor classroom, if you recall, one of the projects and it's underway right now, uh, they're doing the high schools first, is numbering the buildings, the three foot numbers. If you go out to Westwood, you'll see the numbers on all the buildings, that's the direct first responders. If there's an emergency, they're coming up on a school that has multiple buildings, oh, it's building one, we need to go in that direction. What we're also looking at doing is actually on the first floor classrooms having exterior numbers on the outside windows. So if law enforcement, fire rescue is in campus, it could be um, an emergency situation, a burglar on campus, they can determine the location. Okay, that's building 101, that's built, uh, room 101, that's room 102, that's over here is 303, 304. So we're looking at actually numbering the first floor classrooms on the exterior. There are a couple of schools, if you remember, we, we focused on single point entry and uh, we did a great job. And, and modifying those entries. What we're looking at, there's a couple of schools, only a handful, that we're looking at the second layer of security, is that once beyond the lobby area is beefing up a, uh, several of those areas with additional walls, uh, doors with buzzers. So that's the second layer of security we're focusing on here because the emphasis was last year making sure we have single point entry. Reinforce the vision panel. This is something that's pretty common going around the country. The vision panel on the classroom door like that is, and we've talked about different alternatives in uh, reinforcing Lexan. We've talked about a couple of different things that we can go ahead so somebody 
couldn't break through, even though the possibility of that happening is very, very remote. It's a perception, it's a concern. Um, we've seen situations where active shooters have shot through the vision panel. Um, so that's something that we're gonna focus on to see if what we can do with regard to reinforcing. That's, that's a lot of doors too, I wanna point out around the district. Considering adding additional campus monitors, there were two high schools that requested additional campus monitors as a result of the size of the school and the locations. They need to provide uh, some level of security uh, because of the student population in different areas of the school. Uh, that was a recommendation. And expand the student crime watch program to include all schools. Uh, the focus in the beginning was the high schools, the middle, and a K to eight. That occurred. Uh, we have this MOU with Sandy Hook Promise. They've provided training. We had the conference. Uh, that is continuing that partnership. Uh, what we're looking at doing is actually now expanding that to the elementary. We have uh, about half the elementary schools actually have Student Crime Watch. So we're looking at expanding it through the entire elementary system, uh, making sure every school has a, a Crime Watch in place. And what I've done is I've asked the Sheriff's Office, the uh, SRDs, to kind of assist uh, with not only the, the student <coughs> crime watch, maybe uh, present some programs, prevent some guidance, mentoring. Uh, so I've talked to them about doing that in the various schools. And those are the recommendations. Questions? Um, the monitors that we have in the schools, uh, each school has one monitor? Or no, the high schools monitors? have, there's two or three depending upon the school. And we, I have actually, uh, one of the things we have done is train the campus monitors. I've had two trainings with the existing monitors from just the high schools. Are the locations the, of the monitors in the offices? No, they're actually you know, arrival, dismissal. They're out and about in golf carts. They're on patrol. Uh, they do a, a myriad of different uh, type of responsibilities. They may need to pick up a student, bring a student to the front office. But at lunchtime and other times, they want to have that visibility, so. When I say monitor, and when you say monitor, you're talking about the screen where they can see no, different people. parts of the No, I'm talking, campus, I'm talking about okay. the person. So that's, I'm talking about the, the equipment. No. Do we have equipments at schools where at any given time they can see sections of that school? We have camera systems, yes. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, the SRD or the SRO on campus has access, the front office has access. Uh, there's a lot of staff that have access uh, to the camera system. The front office can monitor. SRDs are usually monitoring periodically when they're in their office. Uh, so they are those areas, and there's, all the schools know, the, the staff know the areas of concern. So those are the areas that they try to focus on with regard to monitoring when they are monitoring. So that, yes, they do. So it's not, it's not a constant monitoring? No, that's, that's not, no, we don't have 20, you know, 24 seven monitoring or we don't have a monitoring station or, or center or the, something like, like that. Casino monitor in mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking like office where somebody could glance over there and look and see. Yeah, yes they do that. because we have, uh, like I said, we have deans, APs that have access and they'll routinely have cameras up and it's just that it's not during the entire day. I mean, it may be certain times when they're monitoring, they have times when they may not be monitoring. Ms. Hilson? Yeah. The charter schools that did not sign on into this process, who are they responsible to and are we responsible for them if they don't follow through? Yes, we are. And uh, <laughs> that's why the, the, you know, honestly, uh, to a certain degree, I felt like sending them an invoice for my time because uh, the amount of time that we had to spend uh, with the charter schools uh, as far as making sure they complied, they had to sh indicated that they had an active assailant. Uh, they had to certify that to FDOE. I had to make sure they turned that in on time, that their staff has received training. Um, I had a number of emails. I think I copied Dr. Prince reminders to the charter school principals. Hey, October 1st is around the corner. You need to get your assessment. And uh, we had one principal uh, start it like two days before uh, it was due, and I'm like, come on, you know. <laughs> the check off, uh, that's correct. Right, so, but we have to report, we have to report on their compliance to FDOE. 
So, and that's why in the report, the district assessment that you have, there's like six or seven questions. So I had to make sure I had copies of their certifications, their emails in order to check yes, that they were in compliance in the district report that's going to you for approval. So uh, well, I stayed right on top of them, reminder emails, phone calls, everything, get this in, get this in, because I knew that we were gonna have to respond to FDOE and saying that whether they were in compliance or not. Mr. Ingersoll? Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Just, what about the ones that had chosen, some of the charters had chosen to use their own private security system, correct? They are required. Well, as far as the four charters in Somerset and Renaissance, they have law enforcement. They have contract. Somerset has contract with um, yeah, Port St. Lucie PD, and Renaissance is with the Sheriff's Office. So they have full-time LE on their campus at all time. Now, I can tell you, as far as other parts of the state, I know Palm Beach County had a major issue. They wanted to train armed security on their own, and the state shut them down and said, in order to have armed security, whether it be teachers or staff, they have to go through a specific program that the sheriff's office, they wanted to kind of hire their own company and do their own thing, and they were shut down by the state and said, you can't do that. This is what you have to do. So fortunately, in this county here, our public schools, as well as the charter, have all law enforcement on each campus. Brian, thank you and your team for doing this okay. excellent report. Just, I was watching a video on Facebook, and this is a funny story. The SWAT team was going in there trying to bang down this door and bang down this door, bang down this door, and they couldn't get the door open. One SWAT team member goes and opens the door. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and uh, <laughs> That was funny, man. You can laugh. That was that's funnier than some of your jokes. See, sometimes you get narrowed and you're so narrow in your focus that you know it takes something like that. And, and I say that because you talked about these windows, you know, fortifying these windows and the doors and stuff. And I look at that and I think, man, that's that's a great idea. But when you go to some of our schools, probably a third of our schools, half the pods are open and there's windows all over right. their things. That's right. So I mean, let's don't. But be careful on how we focus, because I was like, yeah, we're going to cover this window, but what about the, all the pods? Well, the big, the main thing with the pods would be is the exterior, exterior doors going door. into the door. I understand that, yeah. but, but we get caught up in this, and I'm like, right. wait a minute here. The more, the more important well, and like I said, these recommendations, we have a standing yeah. committee. We've already had a preliminary meeting. We're going through those, making the determinations as what the priorities are. Yeah. There is... Uh, grant money available again, school hardening grant money. I think it's we're going to receive somewhere between five and six hundred thousand, so we can move forward. That uh, is, uh, I think, due by December first. We have to indicate the projects. So this is going to go a long way in fulfilling that and determining where do we want to spend the additional hardening money. I, I could just see maintenance guys going replacing with, with, <laughs> with no things. They said to replace them all. I could say, oh my. Yeah. Right. And that's what our prioritization is because mm -hmm. when we talk about additional cameras, additional camper cameras aren't necessarily it might help us catch somebody later, but it right. might not necessarily help yeah. prevention. Yeah. Exactly. Safe. So our prioritization really is when it comes to hardening our school is what is going to make our kids say that it's that that um, right. So the, um, and, and one of the things we train in the schools, you know, those windows are covered. In any of the, the, the shootings that you've seen in school centers, if doors are locked and there's a um, out of, um, we call it a hard corner or a safety corner where children are out of sight, staff are out of sight. Um, the, it happened at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. The second floor did everything correct. And um, he walked in the second floor and didn't think anybody was in the building, was, in that, was on that floor. In fact, he even said to himself, where is everybody? So we train folks on that, uh, and and the, and the doors the doors locked and the windows covered and everybody's quiet. So you really don't know if anybody's in there or not. And then if there is some of those areas where the glass, you know, we try to talk about the safety corner, or the hard corner where you, you're out of the line of sight, you hide those kinds of things. And we've and we've drilled our folks on that. Um, uh, Mr. Ingersoll saw it a presentation we made to the principals last week, and I'm probably going to do it for the board in a closed session, um, and I'll schedule it probably before the next board meeting where we had an incident at, um, at Sam Gaines, which, um, which, was, which was very eye-opening, and um, uh, we uh, learned a lot. We learned a lot about um, response, and we learned a lot about what we're doing, and um, so 
We're glad that it occurred. Um, I'm not going to be careful with my comments are, are right now, but I will do a closed session with the board and make that, pre make that presentation to you guys so you can see what we did this um, Monday. And I don't believe I, I, we're going to we're going to be doing the Volo app. We've learned that we need to do some more training on the Volo app, and we're going to have a, uh, a training here in, the, in this building. I'm going to invite the board members. It's at 9 o'clock? 8 o'clock. 8 What? Okay, so we're going to do it at 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock, and then the drill here, it'll be at 930. It's going to be for our, our buildings. It's kind of like a, um, um, what's the word, pilot that we're going to do for our schools, and then we're going to go in and through the month of uh, the rest of this month, and in November, we'll be training, retraining our teachers and our staff members uh, and, uh, and other folks, all staff, on the Volo app and, and some of the uh, things that we've learned from it because it's a brand new system of rolling out. It's really a panic button, if you will, but, um, and then what to do in those kinds of cases. And so there were some lessons learned, a lot of lessons learned from the Sam Gaines. And again, we're glad it occurred because it, if not, it gives you a better perspective of when a real event occurs because these folks thought something actually was happening and what happens and how your mind does. Um, you know, your training either has to kick in, which it did for many, many teachers, um, but then there are also some, also some uh, lessons learned from that that, uh, you know, we'll fine tune. So we presented that to our principals um, the other day. Troy happened to come in a little early and, and saw it. So we'll do that for you all in a closed session as well. And then come on out Monday morning if you want to. If you're up that early, uh, um, and, I'm at uh, Village Green uh, on Monday morning. morning. Okay, <laughs> I made a commitment. And, but then, but but we'll train the board members as well on that separately if we need to. Not a problem. The uh, the important thing that I can't emphasize enough is the layers of security. As far as even if something occurring in say same again is a good example by the teachers having their doors locked, they already have that second layer of security uh, set up. So that's why that's so important and. Spending a fair amount of time in airports over the last couple of days, I can tell you, was drilled into my head many times. The announcer, security is everyone's responsibility, you know, so it's, it's everybody's responsibility uh, to make sure that we have a safe and secure campus. Any more questions for Mr. Luger? Again, I just want to you know, commend him and his team and facilities and, and IT, the whole, because this is a major, major undertaking. You know, for a medium-sized district, a large districts have bigger uh, challenges. I don't we know do how. Have, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we do have law enforcement on every campus. We do have a, uh, a, a safety Thanks net check, uh, Ms. Hilson, for the charters to make sure that we are covered, that we've got a paper trail um, with that. And um, so, we, you know, I feel very, very confident that uh, we've met the, uh, the intent of the legislation. And in a few minutes, uh, we'll call for the vote. Okay. Mr. Superintendent, we have two items for a vote. Uh, take your recommendation. Find my cheat sheet. <laughs> I wrote notes all over today. Well, I recommend the board approve both items that are on today's agenda. <laughs> so we have a recommendation from the superintendent. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Moved by Ms. Hilson. Second. Second by Mr. Ingersoll. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carries four to zero. Are you next? <laughs> John next? No, we're good. We're um, we are, um, we were, you know. I was in person. Okay, board members, anything? Let me, uh, yeah, I do, uh, just a couple yeah. things. Um, we have the training, and, and we'll get, I'll get with Chris to send that information mm -hmm. out. You know, we have our um, ribbon cutting uh, Tuesday. Tuesday morning at 9, so, and then we, um, you'll see the spots back here now that'll say reserve. That's for the school board members right there on the, on the sidewalk. Uh, we should have our badges. Some of them are working now in certain parts of the building, so we're hoping by the end of the week that that will be complete so you'll be, have easy access coming in here. The, um, there was one more thing. Regarding the safety village, uh, the, um, we can get, we'll get the information, wait to hear from them. Uh, Helen and um, Bill met with them as well. What it creates for us, I mean, the concept itself is a good concept. That there's some logistical issues for the school district, particularly in the transportation of students to these, because we have a very difficult time transporting students right now with limited um, availability of bus drivers. So that creates a unique challenge for the district, as well as um, the district is really not in any financial position to supplement any programs right now when we're just trying to, you know, 
maintain what we're doing uh, and being very fiscally responsible for that. So those are some of the some of the challenges. And then um, with kindergarten through two, you know, it's easier to miss. All of these are so important, but the state has placed so many academic. Um, they place more um, uh, mandates on us regarding now, uh, you know, that are important for kids to know, but there's, you know, they don't take anything off our plate. You just add more to that, and your academic day really, um, we start infringing upon uh, academic, uh, mm -hmm. academic time. Um, um, like trafficking is going to be something which is important for our students to know. We have some other issues that are going to be popping up from this legislative session. So every year there's more and more and more. I don't know if you've ever seen the presentation from the guy. I don't know if he did it for the school board that shows like since 1900 to now, everything that's added. been thrown up every decade that's thrown on public schools to, to put out there from whatever, you name it, you know. Um. Well, it, years ago we had this, uh, a couple of people around then with Mr. Heisinger wanted to give us some money towards a building for uh, junior achievement. Oh, he wanted to pay for it and oh, build it. He went, it wasn't going to be paying all of it, no. A majority of it, but he and wasn't no upkeep, run it. No maintenance, no transportation. So we took the trip and we looked at this fabulous facility and what we did was incorporate all those programs into our CTE programs without the facility, without the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that may be something, we, that's why I really wouldn't know what programs are out there that we can build on. Uh, what we're doing internally and uh, what our after school programs are doing on some of these because some of them are doing some of these programs. So uh, that's why I needed an inventory of what's actually going on and <clears throat> what programs are not being met and where the gap is in this community. And uh, so we'll look forward to see if we get some information on that. Madam Chair, I just wanted to ask the question about the land that they're looking at is owned by the school board and IRSC? No. No, okay, ours, that's what's ours. in here. It, yes, uh, the that's land, they're, they're, they asked for land for free. They were, uh, no, was the answer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so they're, they're looking, looking at the land that is uh, behind the swimming pool at Redmondswood by the fire department. And then that ancillary building in the back there is the original Schreiber Center, which is storage for the college. So why, then I'm a little bit confused because this says, they are looking into five to seven acres of land west of I-95 owned by the school district and IRSC. What page are you on? Round table 11, page 11. So that, I assumed that was correct. So that's the round table meeting? Maybe, oh, this has that been two the years ago. Meeting. The round table, I don't know if Mr. Gent was there or not. The round table. Oh, it was because he, he made a comment. Okay, gave the uh, kind of the okay to look oh, into it. I wouldn't say at this point that they have bought into it. I think some of them are waiting for more information also. That was at the very beginning. That was uh, a concept. while ago. The concept. Uh, yeah, that was conceptual. That was a while ago. In uh, 2016. We, yeah. We're not, so um, not, we're not freeing up any of our, um, our land banking. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you.